so here's our agenda. Let's first figure out what I mean by when I say the bigger game. Then, of course, we need some motivation why we're doing this. Uh, then we are going to talk today a lot, lot, lot about after actions and mental models. So we're going to drive into those. Then there's the obligatory reference to an 80s war games movie. And then, of course, in the end, we're going to wrap up and have some discussion, hopefully, about the, around this topic. So let's begin. Uh, the, the title of this talk is inspired by this adage that this comes from game theory, which, which states that there's always a bigger game. And of course, it comes from game theory, which is uh, from Wikipedia, sort of defined as, uh, as this, as you can read from the screen. Basically, it's about making decisions and uh, abstracting the world into mathematical formulations and sort of reasoning things, things about those. And when we say there's always a bigger game, it always refers to the fact that even though you are playing, even if, if you're doing a cer certain thing, there's a superset of that thing that you can always fall back to. Or even if you want to play, uh, if you want to really win in the small game, you might want to move on to the bigger game. Or, to, or your game might not matter because there's a bigger game or whatnot. So the question is then, why are we talking about this? And of course, this is not to talk about mathematics, and I actually, I'm not a game theory expert. I'm more of a game practitioner. I play a lot of games, and this has helped me to formulate the world. But one of the things I'm talking about this at this time is that we have just finished here at Futurist this month our My Impact round, which is uh, twice, a, twice a year we do this thing where we gather feedback from our peers and then figure out how to grow our impact. And of course, you can imagine if you know how to play a bigger game, you can probably grow your impact. So these tools that I'm going to present here, I hope will help some people here grow their impact and figure out how to progress in their careers. And for those who are not futurized, maybe watching this talk sometimes in the future, go to the link that's presented on the screen. Our materials for this My Impact things are there. So if you're interested in how we do that, that's available. But also, like the tools I'm going to present and, and the things that I'm going to say here also help to make sense of the world in a way. The world is a messy place. And it, mental models and abstraction that you can apply to sort of help you think about and reason about how the world is will help you in other, other places than in your tech choices and in your, in your uh, professional life. So let's see if, if I can give you some advice on that. I mentioned we're going we're to talk about abstractions and bigger games. So for, for the uh, examples here, we're going we're to talk about two games. One ga the first game is the so uh, software engineering game because this is Tech Weeklies after all. And the second game is uh, the project management game, which is the game we also are very closely attached with. The software development game, of course, starts from the low level. There's a writing, writing code, writing lines of code game, which is the daily, daily work often. You will sit down and lay down lines of code to fix, it, fix the pieces properly you're working on. But then there's a bigger game. There's application architecture game, how you're going to structure your code files, where, you, where your components go, how are you going to sort of make the mental model of not only one, line, one single file of code into a sort of co a, a whole that somebody else can understand. Then there's the architecture game of like, all right, well, what components is this pro project made of? There's the database layer, there's the front-end application, there's six, six different mobile clients and things like that. Going up, then there's enterprise architecture. You have to choose where your code lives. You have to know what are the games that you need to play here. And on top of that, we're going to, of course, there's always a self-improvement game, right? Like all of this is based on the idea that you want to improve yourself as a software developer and all these sort of all the actions you can do in the, in the, in the lower level games will, of course, contribute to the, the bigger self-improvement game. Then we have this, a different game here. We have this project management game. It has similar steps, but of course, they are not the same. But we're going to return to the interplay of these games soon enough. This is our playing field. We have the different layers of games, abstractions. So what are we going to do about it? And how do we play the bigger game? The first and easiest, easiest bigger game is the meta game, in a way, so that you understand that people come from different backgrounds and they play, they play, they play different games. The game theory sort of relies on the idea that other actors are rational and they make rational choices. And you should remember this when you are, you are talking about other, other people and sort of figuring out why they're making choices. They come from their own games and their own abstractions. And for example, if we take the levels of abstraction we, we, I showed you in the beginning, that they're in the middle, there's a project architecture game and the project requires some game, that it might be actually the only point of intersection between you and a person of playing their other game. 
And when they come with their decisions and their requirements, saying that, hey, this project needs to be this and this and that, you sort of you should understand that they come from this sort of whole stack of layers. They have their daily activities and their career goals, and you have your daily activities and your career goals, but you meet in the middle. And sort of it might cause incompatibleness in your communication. And sort of like you don't necessarily understand where the required requirements are coming from unless you're aware that in fact they are playing also different levels of games at the same time. We'll come back to this subject later with some practical tools on how to navigate this situation. One practical tool that many gamers know uh, is called Think, think Forward, Reason Backward. Uh, there's a puzzle on the screen. Uh, it, this is called the 21 Flags, ga flags game. It's a two-player game, and it's played such that you take between one and three flags every turn, and you win the game if you are the last one to take flags. And can somebody tell me how do you win this game? Who knows this game, by the way? Tony, do I, how do you win this game? Uh, <laughs> Tony says that he has never won, so that's fair. So, a uh, traditional approach, of like, or, or the traditional engineering kind of approach to problem solving is to try to go step by step. You start by, well, let's take one flag and then see what happens and sort of like uh, evaluate. Or this could be the agile framework even. Like, take, take, take one flag and then continue. See, see what's the situation from there. Of course, that's not how you win this game. You win this game if your opponent is in this position. Because in this position, your opponent is forced to take one between one and, one and three flags, leaving you the option of taking one between one and three flags and winning the game. So the goal and the way to win a game like this is to figure out that, hey, wait a minute, there is a situation where I can put my opponent into, which will cause me to really win the game. So you should play in such a way that whenever they make moves, like this is the end goal that you can do. I left, I'll leave you to the exercise to the reader how to do this, but this is the end goal you need to achieve in order to win this game. And this can be then applied to back to your, this stack we had here. Imagine you're writing your component or class or whatever you're doing. For, for example, you can visualize how it's going to look. It's going to be functional. It's going to be self-contained. This is, this, is this is your think forward part, and then you will step back, all right. It has this API call, so it makes it, it is an impure part of my functional, functional code. How do, I, how, how do I accommodate that? And walk back from there and figure out what's, what's happening. When you're de designing your project architecture or like making plans for your project, you will, well, we, we need to publish a web application. What does it mean? It means that it has, has to be put into production. It, that means that there needs to be some platform where we put it. It means it has to be tested. And sort of walk back from the, from the end goal. And you can then drop, drop in between the lines the sort of uh, the, the actions you need to take. And of course, this sort of means that you need to have a plan. So in order to play any game, especially if you want to play the bigger game, you need to sort of develop a plan. Because if you, if you win without a plan, you were lucky. And you are probably not lucky, because luck implies that something improbable happened. So like, rem 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 remember these words when we talk about soon about playing the right game. So this is a thing that. I often happens in projects is that people become frustrated. They are like, we are doing the right things, we are, we, are making, we are making progress, but still client is unhappy, people are unhappy, and uh, sort of like the project is, feels kind of, kind of incompatible. That can be for many reasons, but in this abstraction we're talking about, it might be that you are playing the wrong game. For example, the client is playing the Enterprise architecture game, they are trying to buy the, the, the latest Google Cloud platform things and you are playing the right line of code game. So if you are sort of trying to then sort of discuss it in, in, in these matters, it's not going to work because you are talking on the different abstraction levels. So how do you know you're playing the wrong game? These are some, some of the examples that, that sort of so came to mind. For example, if requirements keep shifting, it means that you are not on the same level of those. You are maybe playing the lower, lower level game of like day-to-day -day activities while the client is playing the bigger game of like trying to please fill some customer needs or I don't know, trying to get a raise for making some, some things happen. And this is something I want to highlight, which I have sort of personally had in many projects, is that if you get really sucked into the day-to-day -day work, for example, of debugging, writing code, figuring out dependencies or whatnot, what can happen is that you lose sight of the bigger, bigger picture. 
And this is, this is a dangerous time because when, if you lose sight of the bigger picture and don't take the time to step away and look back from, from above to what you're doing, so the danger is that you will go to the wrong direction because you, are, you weren't sort of aware of the bigger game that was happening around you and you were played doing the wrong things. So if, if nothing else, I hope that after this talk you will sort of like step out a couple of times and be like, am I doing the right thing and is this the thing that we should, we're supposed to be doing? So, well, we have talked about different levels and that there might be some danger there. So, how do you navigate this? Uh, of course, now that we're moving away sort of from the... Even in, the, in my picture, the, on the lowest level of, of game was the, the writing of the code game and then the others already have all involved communication. Communication is one big, big factor you can uh, employ here to sort of uh, mitigate these effects and sort of shift, shift, shift between different levels of, of, of games. There's an old futurist adage of ask why, which is great. Asking why is a, is a good tool in design and in tech to sort of get to the bottom of the root, to, to the root of issues. The problem with asking why, and this is something from, from for example, if you read Never Split the Difference, the book, is that uh, if you ask people why, you put them on the defensive. You are challenging that why are we, if you ask them like, why are we doing this, you are you're say, stating that like you're, you're doing something wrong. We should do something different. And I'd like to if everybody to sort of encourage everybody to ask why without asking why. Is instead of you should ask how, and ask ask them what. Because when you do these things, instead of putting them into the defensive, you will invite them to sort of solve problems with you. You, you would ask them, how do we make sure this project succeeds? You would ask them, what stakeholders do we need to take into account? And these questions invite them to sort of, like, one, join you in their game, because then you are in, engaging them in a way that like, all right, I want to help you, like, let, let's work together with this. Then you, we, and then you can start hopping on the different game levels and sort of trying to find finding the right place where you need to be at this time. Uh, one classic example is that if somebody comes to you with a deadline and it's like, we need this done in two weeks. And let's say you, you, you have estimated it's going to take one month. One classic sort of way to disarm that, 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 that kind of conflict is to say, what happens if, 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 it, if we don't do it in two weeks? And then they are for, then it's a reasonable question to ask. And it's instead of asking why, because to which they can answer because I told you so, you can ask them what happens and then they will are forced to tell you. If they tell you that, well, nothing will happen, you can do it in one month, which is the most usual outcome if somebody comes with an arbitrary deadline. Or then, then it might reveal you information that is behind the scenes or on the bigger game level and be like, well, shit, that we need to take care of that now instead of like the things you were doing. So getting, getting back to the understanding the existence of different games, and some practical things you can do with that is, for example, when you start a new project or a new thing that you're doing, sort of try to map out the different, different games that are being played. Is there a political situation going on with this, with this project you're doing? Who are the stakeholders? What do they want? Who stands to benefit when you're doing these things? If you, if, if you map them out and, let's say, you make them into a, broad, a deck of presentation about the project or what thing you're working on, you can, use that, you can use that inside the organization's leverage. You can broadcast that, hey, this is our game, we are playing. And then other people will come to you and say, oh, that is very interesting. Let me help you with that. Because if you imagine, for example, remembering that the green one here is the project management game and the, and the, the blue one is the uh, software development game, it might be that there are multiple software development projects that would overlap in the same, same point. And if you can get them all on board with, the, with you, you have more leverage and something is things are going better for you. There's a weird beeping sound going on around here. I don't know what's happening, but yeah, we are pretty, pretty well on time. So I have a couple of parting words before we can hopefully engage in some discussion about this topic. Uh, anyway, so the logisticians in, in the crew will realize that if I say that there's always a bigger game, it means that you are in fact now playing the bigger game or anything that you do is al already a bigger game or something. So which means that sort of no matter what you do, you should be aware that there will be other others on the on, on below on the below levels and on the top levels. So that be aware of what you are where you are there because knowledge is power. If you know what 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 sort of leverage you are now currently on and what things you can pull and things that you can and cannot do, it's knowledge that you have that, that it, which you can use to leverage sort of things that you want inside an organization, inside a comp inside a company or inside a team, for example.
and don't be afraid of the bigger game. Like I said, it, it happens all the time. Like you can't avoid communicate communication. You can't avoid being a part of a bigger whole. And it's the way that it's one of the easy, easier ways to sort of grow your impact and make yourself more to, to sort of find more challenging work to do and to do fun things is to engage sort of either in the in the bigger game in your field, for example, if you are software developer and you would like to become a lead developer slash architect, you need to just start engaging on those on those axes. Ask them the questions. How how should we solve this problem? How how, how should we approach this architectural thing? This is the thing I did. Is it good? Like find the people who are playing that game and eventually you will be playing with them. And it, it goes also on the horizontal axis. People who can play the sort of the, the different games with the project managers and with the product owners and with the designers of the world, they they have more leverage when it, when it comes down to uh, down to like doing things. Like you get to do more interesting things. Just ask them, how do you do this? How can I help you? How can how can we make this project work? Invite them to solve problems with you and play play these games, and you you will be doing more interesting things in the future. That was actually all I had for this time. There's crisp eight minutes for so for fiddling around with uh, the AV equipment to get this trans broadcast to to London, but also some time for questions. So, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Uh, good presentation by Mira. I'm not familiar with the context about the whole like I don't know the. the game thing. I think it's it's an internal uh, concept of futurize and I no longer work here. But, but I have to say that that, that the, the whole like ask why thing, I kind of agree with Miro. Miro I, I think it's like really, Im like in a sense it's a, it's a good idea to ask why, but, but it's also like in human nature that if someone asks why from you, you, you always go the defensive. Either if you, either if you have you have been told that that always like be open to discussion and everything like that. You still in in your mind somewhere. You always go to that defense in a sense, and that's where Miro is right. I, I think it's it's really important to try to somehow like wiggle yourself into a position where where your uh, contradicting argument is not an offense to the the your opponent in a sense and I, I think that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely from if you never like I recommend everybody to read Never Split the Difference the book. It has it deals a lot of with this of like how to sort of in a negotiation situation, how to get how to say no, how to ask why without sort of offending your opponent or making them feel like you're taking something away from them. And then if if you are on the next level so, or playing the bigger negotiation game, is that you can ask why on a thing that you want them to defend. Like if you want to sort of trigger them to defend a point that they would other otherwise do, you would ask a why question about their thing and sort of make them play for you. But this is then, this is further deeper sort of negotiation tactics. So I'm not an expert on those, I ju I'm just a reader. And as for like, is the internal future asking this game thing? It's not, it's sort of my sort of self home cooked sort of way to view, for example, project work. Yes, that project we have the project investigation came. It was came from the audience. And no, note that we have this here. It exists and it it helps. It's it's a tool to help you in the beginning of the game. It's a, it's an actual game that you play in the beginning of the project. It it probably comes down to trust, right? Like if you know the people you're working with, they 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 if you ask them why, it's like probably not a problem with them. Also contextual, it is a famous uh, design paradigm, or not a paradigm, but a technique. If you are doing user research, it's called ask why five times. So if I would be selling you this mobile phone and I would ask you like, well, do you like the, the shape of this mobile phone? And you would say, it's fine. And then I'll ask you, why is it fine? And then you say something and I say again, why? You will dig at least, if you ask why five times in that context, if, when you want to get information out of somebody, it's sort of, Kind of proven or this sort of sort of research area that you will get get deep insights, but and of course, like communication is hard, right? Like some people can ask why without offending people, but it's it's in, it's in general, sort of if you can avoid it, I, I don't see a reason not to. <laughs>